Elder Mike is going to be bringing us a word from the Scriptures. And as always, whenever Elder Mike speaks, it's always something from his heart that he receives from the Lord to our hearts. And uh, Michael, could you please come? And there is a long-standing tradition between the elders of this congregation to uh, pray for each other when they uh, bring God's word. And so with that, I guess I turn things over to Alan. Is this correct? Join us, Rabbi. You're one of us. Or we're one of you. <laughs> Avina Malkainu, our Father and our God, Lord, we just take the light, Lord. We join with, with Mike. Father God, we pray, Lord, that uh, the words that he speaks this morning would reach out everywhere and touch the hearts of, of all those that are listening, Lord, and do damage to the kingdom, to the attempted kingdom of the adversary. Lord, we thank you, Lord, for his friendship. We thank you for the time that he has invested in uh, meditating and study and research, uh, Father, and searching the depths of his heart, Lord, for the words that he is, that you have given him this morning. And we pray in the name of Yeshua. Amen. Thank you, Rabbi, and thank you, Ellen. Um, prayers mean the world to me and for the prayers of the congregation and um, I'm grateful for them and today I wanted to talk about um, maybe not address what's going on in our culture what has been going on in the past year or in the past couple of years either with uh, the COVID or the election or all the violence and everything I did want to talk about that and speak to it and um, had a really unique experience in preparing this message for that uh, the verses I chose are from Luke 18, verses 35 through 43. And I don't know why I chose those verses when I started to, to prepare this message. Um, I wanted to talk about uh, how we still hear God's voice through turbulent times. In fact, the title of my message is Plowing the Ground that You're On, and my subtitle is Hearing the Harmonica. And so I picked these verses, and I don't know if I could reconcile them in my head, but... Uh, my heart was gravitating through this, and my mind was going through something. Well, there's so many verses about Israel being carried away into exile or being under siege, and the Lord moving in those times in very powerful ways. But, um, Reb, I don't know if you've ever had this experience preparing a message that your, your heart is telling you something else, and you just follow it, and you, you can't get away from it. So I chose these verses for that reason. And... Um, Again, they're, they're from Luke, so somehow I'll try to make it work, I guess. I hope I can. But it really is about hearing God's voice through these things. And the account I chose is about this blind man outside of Jericho who heard that the Lord was passing by, and he cried out to him a first time, Son of David, have mercy on me. He cried out the same thing a second time, which is very significant. And the point being is that it turned out to be this very beautiful moment between Messiah and this man, and also a life-changing moment for this man and the crowd following when we see how these, these verses end. It's been a really loud year, loud couple of years in our culture, in our society, watching the news. I don't know about you, but I'm really sick of seeing that computer-generated graphic of the coronavirus every night to open the news, just spinning slowly in the music in the background, and then going to the next story about some group in Minneapolis or in Washington getting violent or politicians just devouring each other with words. And it seems like the loudest voices in our culture, in our society this past year, have been really the most destructive and really didn't accomplish a lot except maybe trying to seize some sort of power. And I don't really have an opinion about it one way or the other anymore. I'm just tired of people saying, hey, our world has changed forever. We have to adjust. Well, yeah, yes and no, I guess. Uh, we have to adjust a little, but still... God has not changed, his voice hasn't changed, and yet it still keeps moving forward, faster, more forward to the, um, than these things that we've been listening to. I use this analogy in the past, sometimes when you're listening to music and it's a band playing and all the instruments, sometimes you, you pick out one instrument that just catches your ear, 
for me, I like, um, I pay attention to the drummer. I mean, a really good drummer can make a very bad band sound good sometimes. And I, I love how mathematical a drummer is in that you, you count to eight and then he does a little, little bump on the things and then starts again. And yet he can be still very creative within that structure. I always point these out to, to my wife when we're driving or something and she's so kind that she actually acts interested in what I'm saying sometimes. Uh, she's heard it a thousand times. But I remember um, a few years back when my dog Lenny was still alive, I was sitting at home listening, listening to music, and it was a Sunday morning. It was a really sunny day, I remember. And uh, he was laying on the floor, just lazing in the sun the way dogs do. And this band I liked was playing. I had on a CD, because I'm a dinosaur. I still listen to CDs. And, uh, and this band featured a female singer who every once in a while would pull out a harmonica and start playing it during the song. Well, Lenny was just laying there, not paying attention to it. And then when she started playing this harmonica, his head went up, his ear went up, he got up and he kind of sauntered over to the speaker like dogs do and like turned his head sideways. The sound resonated with him between uh, the drums, the guitar, the bass, and all this other stuff and the vocals. The harmonica resonated in his ear. And I thought, isn't that how the Lord's voice is supposed to be with us in these times when we're listening to all this stuff and the stuff we listened to the past couple of years with the election was all fear-based and anger-based and loveless and... Uh, didn't even make sense, and it was manipulating to the point where, boy, you can't watch the news anymore. It just, uh, it's the same thing. It's, so you could, they could play the same new ca newscast every night. Yeah, the coronavirus, the election, politicians mad at each other, the Sabres are still losing. Every night. So it's, it's um, you know, it got to the point where, you know, people were out talking, even believers were going and reading, like, these prophetic things online, and really, God's word was still there. The Bible was still there. His voice was still being heard among this stuff. We just have to remember to listen to it. So if we could turn to our verses from Luke 35 through 43. As Yeshua approached Jericho, a blind man was sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard the crowd going by, he asked what was happening. They told him, Yeshua of Nazareth is passing by. He called out, and this is very significant, Yeshua, son of David, have mercy on me. Those who led the way rebuked him uh, to be quiet, but he shouted all the more a, a second time, also very significant, son of David, have mercy on me. Yeshua stopped and ordered the man to be brought to him. When he came near, Yeshua asked him, what do you want me to do for you? Lord, I want to see, he replied. Yeshua said to him, receive your sight, your faith has healed you. Immediately he received his sight and followed Yeshua, praising God. When all the people saw it, they also praised God. This was a life-changing moment for everybody in the crowd. And you know, what does this verse have to do with everything we've experienced in the past couple of years, except that it points out this very intimate and beautiful moment between this man and Messiah and Yeshua. That this, um, this connection they made and what this man was actually asking for. What I love about these verses, what I've always loved about reading the Gospels is that um, Yeshua is aware and sensitive to the human condition, first of all. A lot of his miracles that we read about have to do when he was on his way to preach, going somewhere else, and somebody, somebody obscure on the side is, Lord, if you're willing, you can make me clean, you can heal me. My son died, can you raise him? And we're told in scripture over and over again in the gospels that he was moved with compassion. So there's this man, this insignificant, seemingly man on the side of the road amongst this huge crowd, which was loud, by the way, very loud. They were following him, and Yeshua was sensitive to it, which fits perfectly into the nature of what God is, of what he came to do, of what Yeshua came to be. Because you read throughout the history of Israel, one of the first things we read about the deliverance of Israel from slavery is God telling Moses, I've heard the cries of my people and I have compassion on them. And he moved in that area. We're told in the Gospels that a widow came out. Her son was dead, her only son. And it says he was moved with compassion and gave, and gave her son back to her. And it's, um, you know, the miracles are amazing, but the heart behind it is even more amazing. The heart of God, the heart of Yeshua moving in this situation. But I think the key to this, again, isn't the miracle. 
It's, you know, he did that all the time. I think the crowd was following him because they heard some things about him. They heard that he was able to work these miracles. Some of them have saw, have seen what he has done. But I think the key to this whole account is what this man cried out. He didn't ask for a specific healing right away. He wasn't asking somebody who, well, maybe this guy knows how to heal people. I've heard some things. It wasn't a generic person. He wasn't saying, hey, mister who might be able to heal me, can you come over here and take a look in my eyes? He cried out a very specific, son of David, have mercy on me. Son of David, have mercy on me. When you use that terminology, when you use the term son of David, you're encompassing everything that God was, everything prophetic, the entire history of Israel, what Yeshua came to do in the present, and the fact that he was going to sit on the throne of David forever and ever. So this man was crying out to something eternal, something historic, something powerful, and something eternal. It was very specific. I don't know how he knew to do this. Maybe he was around teachers in a synagogue. I don't think so because from what I've read, in his day, blind people weren't allowed in the synagogue because it was believed their blindness was caused by some sort of sin. Um, so he cries out this very specific son of David. So he's crying out to someone he knows to be the Messiah, somebody he knows to be the Son of God, somebody he knows who will be sitting on the throne of David forever and ever. And the second part of his cry was, have mercy on me. He didn't say specifically heal my blindness. So I might be taking a liberty with this or stretching it a little bit, but um, when you're asking for mercy, you're also asking for something more complete than a specific individual healing. Yeah, he wanted to be healed of blindness, he needed to be healed from blindness, but the term have mercy on me implies something more. It implies the person you're asking, have feelings for me, care for me, show your love for me. I'm in this condition, come to me. And not just heal me, make me complete. When you ask for mercy, you're asking for God to make you complete. As I said, it was believed uh, in Yeshua's day when a person was born blind that it was a result of sin, either the sin of their parents or the person's sin. Remember another account when he healed a blind man, when the disciples said, said to him, who sinned, this man or his parents? The reason they asked that, because it was believed that sometimes the birth of a blind child was a result of a parent who had an unlawful or inappropriate sexual relation and left a disease in them, and the child's, the baby's eye would rub against the womb as he came out and cause blindness. There's actually... Uh, some people who believe that in the, in the medical profession. I don't know if that's true or not. Um, I don't care, actually. But the fact is, it, that's what was believed in his day. So this man may have been aware of that. He may have been treated like an outcast because of that. So when he said, Son of David, have mercy on me, he wasn't just asking for the healing of his sight. He was asking for a completeness of God. Have mercy on me. Forgive me. Whatever caused this, rebuke this sin. And the fact that he shouted out twice, and the word for shout, there's two different Hebrew words in this account, and I'll explain that later if I remember. But he shouted out, complete me, basically. We live in a world where I think sometimes believers fall into the trap of expecting God to be a means to an end. Lord, just put these things in order in my life, and it'll be okay, I'll be okay. I don't need you for anything more than that. Just make everybody think the way I think and act the way I want them to act and feel the way I want them to feel and life gets so much easier because I don't need to change, they need to change. And I think sometimes if it's a financial need or just a physical need or anything else or something in your family, I think that um, we can use God as just a means to an end and fix this one thing when God wants to be more complete with us, when he wants to fill our hearts with other things, when he wants to break ungodly connections that only him and maybe him and I know about. So there's always that, that trapping. And the other trapping, too, is I think at first, before we get to the end of this account, the crowd was following him for what they knew he could do or heard he could do or saw him do, that they were following the miracle more than the miracle worker. So this crowd... Um, followed him because of what they saw. And I, I almost get the feeling this man, this blind man cried out to Yeshua because of who Yeshua was, not because he could just work a miracle. He could have tried doctors or anything else for that, for that matter. And it seems that um, sometimes, again, the second trapping that believers can get into 
is always looking for an outside answer to, uh, to their problems be before they go to God. I think in the past few years, it seemed like the church almost did that a little bit. We were hoping so much in other things, whether it be politics or doctors or anything else, to, uh, to solve the problems of our culture before, uh, instead of just turning to God or asking God to bring the changes about that. It's like we want God to work inside our structure very often, and sometimes our expectation is we don't expect him to work outside our structure, or we don't need him to work outside our structure. And we start to uh, just look to worldly things, worldly answers. The world, I think the believing world these past couple years depended so much on what was going on in the culture, you know, from the things we read online and what people said and what people felt they had a word from God for this or that or this candidate or that candidate, when really these were just two angry guys, it seemed like. And I'm, I'm not dismissing anything that uh, the past president has done. The fact is, he just wasn't an answer to what this country needed, to what this culture needed as well. When did the election become such a source of hope for believers? When did it, uh, we put so much energy into it? And something I, sometimes I really resent it when somebody feels they can define my faith based on their perceived, uh, their perception of what my political leanings are one way or the other, as if my faith and my social or political beliefs are, are on equal ground, as if they both provide the same answer. They didn't. Like I said, these were a couple of angry guys uh, saying some angry things, really not getting a lot done. Um, and things did get done the past four years. I'm not dismissing that, and I'm not putting down one candidate over another. I'm just saying they can only go so far. They have a low ceiling. Uh, they're temporary. Their answers are temporary, and there's not much they can do. And it, it just seems like we put so much hope in them and so much faith. I'm reminded in a, the book of Samuel when Israel asked for a king, um, and they went to Samuel and said, we want a king like the nations have. And Samuel took us to the Lord, and the Lord said, well, there's a history of them doing that. They've done it you know, for generations, seeking something else, chasing something else. And... Um, and it's, again, it always seems like the believing community has fallen back to a place where they're relying on things that are temporary, things that don't really have answers. It's what Israel did. There was a history about it. But as I think about that, how they went to Samuel and they asked for a king, I also um, remind myself that why revival in the church is so hard to come by and why it seems so often short-lived and I think it's because we've come to recognize revival as God moving his hand in our culture and our society and changing things morally and um, in politics or in, the, in the, our da the daily fabric of our life. And it seems like um, that's the hope. But that's not really revival. Revival isn't God changing our culture while we're busy blaming everybody else. It starts with the believers first, doesn't it? It starts with repentance. Repentance always precedes revival in the Bible. It's humbling ourselves before the Lord no matter what the culture is doing. And I think uh, in Samuel, even though God says, yeah, there's a history of my people doing this, choosing other kings, falling away, the fact is the people give us a hint specifically why at that time they wanted another king because they go to Samuel and they said, you know what, the priest failed. Eli and his sons failed. Samuel's sons failed. So what do they have? What else do they have to latch on to? You know what? You're not doing the job, so we want a king like the nations have. That's actually what happened in the book of Samuel. It says it. It says it very clearly in there. And they fail to remember that it doesn't matter who's failing. It doesn't matter in leadership who's failing, what government is failing. We're reminded that God did his most awesome and powerful works under oppressive governments in the Bible. The history of Israel, we have Israel crossing territories through violent civilizations and God doing amazing things. We have God bringing them out of Egypt, bringing the waters down over the, um, over the Egyptian army. And what about the book of Daniel? You know, we read the book of Daniel, they were under siege, they were in exile, and the prayers of Daniel had a great effect. In fact, at one time, Daniel prays, and 21 days later, an angel, an actual angel, actually comes to him and says, I've heard your prayer when you first started. It took me 21 days because of the battle that was going on. That had an effect 
on Daniel, on the culture around him. Not because Daniel was a great man, because Daniel believed that God was great. And God changed fear. One of the greatest events, in fact, probably the greatest event in history that the world will never recognize, is the actual physical coming of Messiah to this earth. Actually, him putting his feet on this earth and walking among us and teaching us. It's God incarnate in this earth, the greatest life-changing, world-changing event in history. And he came on a night when kings and queens and rulers and Caesars ruled the world without noticing it. And I always makes me smile to think that the first witnesses to Yeshua coming to this earth were shepherds and animals. And there's only one king who paid a little attention to it, and that was Herod. And his reaction was, well, let me kill as many babies as I can. Because the first sign of evil historically in a situation is to kill innocent children and pass some sort of law that makes it righteous and okay to do that. So that's, that's a warning that all civilizations today could, could take note of. But that's when God has done his greatest work. When Israel crossed the Jordan and went in, into the Promised Land and they were outside of Jericho, and the Lord told them what to do to tear down the walls of Jericho, to march around it seven times up for seven days, and on the seventh day seven times, then give a trumpet blast and a shout and the walls would come down. I firmly believe God could have knocked those walls down without help from any of the people. He's, he's that great. But I kind of believe what he wanted to do was he wanted them to participate. He wanted them to step up. He wanted them to feel his presence and to work with it. And he wanted them to, uh, to know his presence. He wanted to like, touch fingers with him and connect with him. It's kind of like that Michelangelo painting of, of creation where the, the two, I heard a friend of mine calls that painting, the two muscular guys touching fingers. And that's what God wanted to do. He wants his people to participate and know him, and know that he's moving. It's interesting that when he told them to do this, they were led by the priest first, not the warriors. They were led by the priest, the warriors followed, and then the shout that brought the walls down. And what's interesting about that shout, it's um, the, the actual Hebrew translation is not just a loud voice, it's a destructive, thundering voice, violent almost. So when you go, it's interesting, when you go back to that blind man outside of Jericho, the first time he cried out, the Hebrew word used there means a loud voice. His second shout is the same word used when the Israelites shouted outside of Jericho. His second word translates into a destructive, violent voice. So there's more than a healing for blindness going on. There was something being shattered. There was something being claimed. It's more of a deliverance going on in that case, despite everything that was going on around him. The crowd told him to be quiet, so he gave a second, louder, destructive voice. We live in a culture now where the world is telling us to be quiet. And it almost seemed like, and, um, this isn't any judgment, I'm sorry if it sounds that way, that the church, the body of Messiah has, has kind of agreed. Okay, we'll, we'll be quiet. We had four years, I think, of a president, I, I think who almost made the atmosphere fertile for the church to rise up a little bit. And I don't think it did. I don't think it, um, I think it said, well, he's doing it. This is our answer to prayer, so we'll watch him do it. And I think they, that's my opinion. It took a step back. I know there's so many opinions out there. But the wall that they built, that these people built, is like the wall outside of Jericho. It's really nothing to be afraid of. When Israel marched around the city of Jericho to knock that wall down, God was flip-flopping their perspective. All of a sudden, they're not the ones to be afraid. A wall around a city is not a beacon of strength. It's a beacon of fear. And God wanted to teach us that. What's been going on in our culture, I mean, with leadership that, again, has devoured each other, who has lied, who has caused division. I'm really getting annoyed at the little public interest commercials that come on and say, hey, America, we stuck together. We did it. We got through it together. No, we didn't. It's still very nasty out there. It's still very divided out there. It's not very godly out there. And what they're calling good and bad and righteousness and unrighteousness, it's all flip-flopped. And it really has nothing to do with us sticking together and us, you know, we'll hang in there together because we live in a world that doesn't like each other too much, it seems to me. You know, again, just my own observation. When Yeshua was crucified, when he fulfilled the sacrifice, the requirement of the law, 
for a lamb without blemish, for atonement. His disciples were crushed. They were devastated. They were frightened. They ran and they scattered. When he rose from the dead, the opposite. They were overjoyed. In fact, after he rose from the dead, he even told them before this would happen, yeah, I'll, I'll be crucified, I'll rise in three days. They didn't get it. I understand. It's a lot to process. But when he rose from the dead, they were overjoyed, and he gave them this, what we call the Great Commission. Go out, preach the good news, heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out demons, tell them the kingdom of God is near. And still after that, in the beginning of the book of Acts, they said, well, are you going to, uh, well, you're here, well, you got your work clothes on, you're going to get rid of Rome? And he didn't really answer them directly, but that's not what he came to do. He didn't come to change the government. He didn't come to change our culture. He came to change our hearts, the hearts of believers, to rise up. Matthew 24, he lays out all these signs of the end times. And he says, if you hear of Messiah in the desert or in a closed room, don't follow it. If you hear this, that, and the other thing, pay attention. We're supposed to care about those things, but we're supposed to choose a better king. He told them, don't get carried away by these signs. You still have work to do. You still have to plow the ground that you're on. That doesn't mean you have to go into the missions field because the ground that we're on is right here. Our heart is still supposed to hear his voice, still supposed to hear the harmonica. When he told his disciples what they're going to do to go out and heal the sick, he was teaching them how to play the harmonica. He played it for them. He said, now go play it. Don't worry about what the government is doing. Don't worry about what Rome is doing. Don't worry about all these other things. We're going to be hearing these things from now to the end of time. If we're going to sit here and wait for God to move in our government so our culture is orderly and moral and right, that'd be great. Those things are important. I'm not dismissing those things, but there's so many voices out there. We have to still follow the one that we've heard originally that is still moving, that is still loud. Um, if we want revival in this country, it comes through us. It comes through my heart. It comes through your heart. It comes through believers' hearts out there in the community, in this world. The first thing about um, revival is a change of heart, not a change of culture, not a change of our society. Those things may be a result. They may not. It doesn't really change what we're called to do out there, does it? So um, the point, I guess, I wanted to make of this message that the very beautiful connection, despite the crowd telling this man to be quiet, the intimate connection that this man made, and Yeshua reacted to it. Not to what the crowd is, probably a very loud crowd. And we're told at the end that this man went away praising God and following him, and so did the crowd. The change came, not as this man received his sight, as that Yeshua moved in this man's life.